I entered McGill in 1942 towards the end of World War II, and our first uh, assignment there was to uh, have all our COTC uh, U, U uniform and boots and so on, and we had to go out west harvesting because all the available men were out to the war. Okay. And, and how old were you uh, at that time? Oh, uh, I can't remember, but that's insignificant. <laughs> I landed in a town in Saskatchewan called Assiniboia. Okay. And, and I didn't know anything about far farming, and I was in charge of a, of a team of meal, and we would way, wake up before the dawn to get fed, and then, and then I had a team of meal which I brought, brought out to uh, the field to do some stooking mm -hmm. and gathering of uh, the wheat and so on. That was my first assignment at McGill. And I McGill. didn't know what McGill was all, all about. <laughs> <laughs> Would you consider that your first real job? Oh, no. I started to uh, work uh, in a Chinese restaurant four or five years before then, when okay. I was a teenager. Okay. And Where worked, were you born, exactly? Uh, I was born in Montreal. Okay. I was born in Montreal, brought up in Montreal, graduated in Montreal, worked in Montreal, and retired in uh, Calgary. In Calgary. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this was my uh, early part of life when, when I decided to leave home. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, at school, what were you uh, taking exactly? What, what uh, was we, your degree going to be? In, in uh, the old time, they call it the metallurgical engineering department, but now they call it materials engineering. And, uh, and some of my uh, work that, that I did while I, I was at university, I prefer not to talk about them. <laughs> the, Why not? <laughs> the greatest thing that, that I did there was to uh, uh, to in the true use our metallurgical engineering department to a material at Christmas time we call purple Jesus, <laughs> yeah. which is uh, a grape juice and, uh, and, I've and heard of that. alcohol. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we use the very pure al alcohol, the 99 plus per percent, which we <laughs> need for, for uh, polishing metallurgical samples okay. so they will not stain. And that's what we use to spike our, uh, our grape juice. With. Makes for quite a party. Yeah. <laughs> Purple so, Jesus, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> right on. so that was my highlight at McGill. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I like it. Hmm. And um, you entered uh, metallurgy. Uh, why or, or when did you think to yourself, that's what I want to do? What, what was your first interest? Well, uh, I, I backed into me metallurgy because I, I looked at uh, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, those are the three great things then. And I said, it doesn't seem to interest me at all. I'll try something that I don't know a thing about. Okay, yeah. That's how I got into metallurgy. Wanted to really learn something completely new. Completely different. And you liked it from the get-go? or I, I liked it right from the beginning. And uh, the uh, greatest thing, too, was that uh, the chemistry lab was was uh, two and three floors up above us and and they use a lot of uh, mercury mm -hmm. for for their measuring and testing and we had to sum, sum up in the basement 
And around Christmas time, we would gather the mer mercury in a sump pump, and we sell it to buy our alcohol. <laughs> Your purple Jesus. <laughs> purple Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you will get another interview like this. Where they start off by talking about Purple Jesus. I don't think so, but it's good. It's a good start. It's a great so, start. Yeah. Well, uh, when I graduated, mm -hmm. jobs were very hard to come by in 1947. And uh, a firm from Paris wanted to set up a lab here because their labs in around Paris and France were de devastated yes. by the war. And they sent three pe people in to Montreal to set up a, a lab. Montreal is a good place for it because it's French speaking and so on. And I landed up with a job with with air liquid, that's mm -hmm. Canadian liquid air, and I worked for them all my working life. Your entire career? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I've heard you've done a lot of work with that liquid. Yeah. 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 Um, all, all my work was done with air liquid from the time I got my first job there until I retired. Wow. Over, 20, so over 25 years wow. ago. Wow. I uh, was walking down the street last night and I saw there's a building on this uh, on this street uh, where the Westin is on the on 4th Street uh, with the uh, Alley Kid on it. And I think there's offices there. Yes, yeah. yes. Did you ever work there? No. No? Okay. So, I retired 25 years ago. <laughs> they, <laughs> they don't even <laughs> know <laughs> me, uh, except <laughs> I would go in from time to time and get a free cup of coffee. Okay, there you go. There you go. A few <laughs> perks. So, um, what was your first job with Alley Kid? It's dealing with uh, with heat treatment of steel. The reason for it is that uh, to to make some of the atmosphere for heat treatment of steel, we reform some of the gases to get a neutral gas, and some oxygen is required there. Mm -hmm. So that's how we got started. Uh, and uh, then uh, it, it came a point in time when, uh, when I said, gee, there must be some industrial gas requirement in refining of molten steel. That's where I got into pyro me metallurgy. Okay. And, uh, and uh, you will see one, one of my re reports there on on the porous plug, where uh, uh, they would have a lay ladle of steel, and they would have an ingot to plunge into the molten steel to mix it up so they get a uniform bath of steel so that they can cast the steel with uniform properties from the start of casting to the end. Okay. And I said, that is backwards, that is dangerous. So I, so, so that's when I developed the porous plug and you will have a report of uh, that. Okay. Which I just gave you. And if you could explain it uh, quickly in layman's terms, yeah. how, what would you, how would you explain yeah. it? Uh, what does it do? I, I, I said, it's dangerous to get an ingot and plunge it like that. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we can use some gases in, in a porous brick and place in the bottom of a ladle and put gases through to stir the bath up? That would be a very good way of, of doing it. Okay. And that's how, uh, as you will see in the report, how I developed a porous plug. Okay, so more of a from the bottom approach yeah. and less yeah. from, a, from the top. Yeah. So I, I went to brick manufacturers and I said, I would like a porous brick. And I said, not only porous, but continuous porous so I can put some gas through under pressure. Well, they showed me the door and said, we want to make our bricks as dense as possible so they can last as long as pos possible. 
And then the, the government, uh, in the old days, they call it the Department of Mines, uh, had a refractory lab there, and I approached them, and they said, well, we'll help you to make a porous brick. And we were successful in developing a porous brick, okay. which was usable. And now it is used throughout the world. Ch it changed the world of yeah. metallurgy. Yeah. So you not only came up with the idea of, of, of finding a new technique, but yeah. you also developed the, the actual de brick. Developed the actual brick. You will that you will read in that little report that I showed you. Okay. Yeah, I know which I'll, I'll look and, at. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and no one knew about that. So my wife said, you developed that 60 years ago. Why don't you tell the people how it came all, all about? And that was the time I was sitting in the bathtub and I released some Flatus, they call it a fart. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's the idea. That's how it came there from. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's how I got the highest award of the AIM. From uh, farting in the bathtub. Yeah, farting in the bathtub. <laughs> hey, you, you've got to get ideas somehow. Okay. <laughs> Right on. Well, I don't think you'll be able to use too much of this in your formal <laughs> no, presentation. No, I like it. I like it. This is good. This is what we want. This is what we well, want. I, have, I have made that presentation to around a thousand people, so why can't I feel more hair about it? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's what we're... There is one thing which I can tell you. Mm -hmm. If it is not fun, that project gets delayed. And it, any project? Uh, any project mm -hmm. where I think it's fun and my staff will enjoy it, they get the first choice. Okay. Because you'll be more productive. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And um, what, you, what would you say throughout your career with uh, Ali Kid was your, um, what was the most difficult project if we're talking about projects? Now? The most difficult project was at the time, uh, at the beginning, uh, there was this uh, technology for refining steel where they use a supersonic oxygen lens from the top okay. of the bath. And, and I said, see, that's a backward way of doing it. We should find a way of putting oxygen through the bottom. And, and that was a big project. And it took many, many years and we were successful in uh, developing a nozzle which can stand the reaction between oxygen and molten steel where the theoretical reaction temperatures is around 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Don't ask me what far, uh, centigrade it is in, <laughs> because that's new stuff. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah, it's true. Eh? So, so, so your entire career you worked with yeah, uh, that so, system. So I, so I developed the technology where I can use submerged oxygen to refine molten steel and keep the integrity of the in injectors uh, in good shape for commercial use. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the pro, uh, the project, the process is called the OBM, Oxygen Bottom Bed Metallurgy, which was uh, uh, commercialized in, uh, in Germany at a plant called Maximilian Hütte. And uh, then uh, U.S. Steel would like that technology and they had to to uh, get a uh, license from Maximilian who to, so U.S. Steel can use it in North America. And the U.S. Steel call it the Q-Bob Quick Basic o o Oxygen. Q-Bob Quick Basic Oxygen? Yeah. The, the, the normal process on top lancing is uh, BOP, the basic oxygen process. 
and then they change it and call it Q bulb, quick o oxygen bulb bottom blowing or some, okay. something like, like that. Was it named after you, Bob? No, no, <laughs> no, no. That's just a coincidence? The only thing is that we've got some royalties from it. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. So how long was that project? You said many years? Uh, it, it started in 19... You know, we developed that uh, injector technology in 1974 in a little lab in in uh, a town in Quebec called Cap de la Madeleine, just on the other side of the river from Tour Rivière. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's where we developed the bottom injection technology, okay. which eventually went commercial. Yeah. Excellent. And you got royalties from the it. <laughs> and, no, uh, early kid got the royalties. Yes, okay. Mm. The only thing they did right after that, I say, what else are you going to do for us? <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't stop, apparently. Mm. Uh, have plenty. We'll get to that in a, a bit later, but you had plenty of uh, patents and inventions, not just the, the ones you had mentioned. Um, other than early kid, are there any, uh, you, you said your entire career was with Ali Kid, but are there any organizations or, um, or even committees or other companies you worked with or joined or, or founded? Yes, uh, I, I, uh, I got in, involved with, with a firm called uh, Hydrogenics, which uh, developed uh, the hydrogen fuel cells. And, uh, you know, it is used in uh, high, hydrogen electric cars and, yes. uh, and so on. The reason why I uh, went there was that uh, they needed some, someone to help, help them to, uh, to get some fun, funding so that they can continue their work. So I got in, involved with them. And and we got the investment, oh maybe a, a hundred million dollars, so they can continue their research work. And the name of the company is called Hydrogenics, which is still in operation and they're still doing quite well. I was now. gonna say hydrogen cells are are, are still just just the beginning, I'd yeah, say. Yeah. All right. And we were there before they had cars or yeah. anything like, like that. It was just the actual cell that they were yeah. developing. Okay. Did they have, do you know if they had any, what was going to be their idea for its first use? If, if, they, if they did develop a hydrogen cell, what was going to be the first use? Uh, Today they, we think of cars. They, they were thinking of, of cars. And, cars as well. And, and we actually put it in, some, in a few of these cars uh, which uh, which came from Germany, these little go cars. Okay. So that and and they were successful powering the the little go karts. Or? Oh yes, but uh, the the uh, thing thing is that the unfortunate thing is everybody jumped into the bandwagon. GM jumped into the wagon. Uh, Toyota jump into the wagon, and how can a small firm like Hydrogenics compete with them? So we use use these two to produce H H two for for these uh, cell cell phone towers. They, they okay. use H two there. So okay, so there's yeah. another use. Yeah. Hmm. Well, at least you, uh, even though became, a, I can say, monopolized in a way, it really helped start the, the hydrogen cell yeah. uh, industry. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. for sure. <laughs> so like, uh, like the uh, steel making technology, I e ended up getting zero royalties. Zero royalties? <laughs> <laughs> you win some, you lose some, eh? <laughs> Um, as for, so your entire, um, career with, with Ali Kid, what were, what were the social activities or other than Purple Jesus when you were 
when you were a student afterwards uh, within your career, you and, and all your colleagues, what was, what, other than work, what was yeah. uh, a popular thing to do? Well, at that time, it was the only thing that I really did. Uh, so we, you, were, we, you lived uh, for your job. Yeah, mm -hmm. we uh, uh, had, had a very, very good team, a small team, uh, about 20 people in our re research department. And uh, every pro project that, that we did, we have the safe, safe, safety boys in the vault, uh, the gas uh, technologists in, in the vault, and, and, uh, and the scientists. So every project that we had, we got them all involved because you can get an input from each of that, those groups. Of course. Even though it was a very small group, we were very, very successful. And uh, we were so successful that the, uh, the uh, industrial gas department asked for our help anytime they had problem selling something to a client and uh, and the head of Air Liquid Canada said that uh, the, uh, our involvement in technology transferred to our commercial department is so great that it more than pay for our research department. Oh wow. So we had the uh, carte blanche. In any time we had a new, uh, a, a new, uh, say, research grant that we need for a new project, management just signs <laughs> it off. They were so confident. Yeah, they were so As confident. As you guys were so productive. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, th these were with boys whom we trusted. And uh, I had one manager who started off this department and even after I became the head, I still had him because his knowledge of French was superb and he translated everything in, ah. in French for the French okay. folks. He was very bilingue. Yeah. <laughs> very bilingual. He's a very, very, and he spoke French much better than the average French person in Montreal. Okay. Yeah. His name is Guy Savard. Guy Savard, okay. Yeah, whom, whom I had a partnership with him all my life there. I think he might actually be on my list for uh, in the future to, yeah. to go interview. So at that time, were, what, was your, what was your position? What was your title? Um, my title is all in my CV there, depending mm -hmm. on the okay. time. And it's been a long time. I, yeah, it's over <laughs> 25 years ago. How can I remember? It's true, all true. In, in my CC okay. either. I will look. Um, as for, I, I asked about the social activities, but you seem to say you were pretty, uh, work was, was not only work, but that was part of your social time yeah, too, it was right. work. And was there a, a big, said it was a small team, was there a big turnover? Uh, no. Or was it always a very constant, they, those 20 guys? They love to stay. They mm -hmm. love to stay. We had a few boys uh, which, uh, which went, went to the commercial department because uh, they can progress faster in the commercial department than in our research group. Okay. So they went. Not because they were doing a bad job, but they can see their career increasing faster. Okay, yeah, for sure. And um, maybe getting into the um, big grittier uh, question. Uh, were there in that line of work, maybe not necessarily just with your with your specific group, but in in uh, Alley Kid or even metallurgy in general? Uh, did you see any kind of um, social uh, pro social problems, uh, trends, uh, whether it was um, alcoholism or, or drug use or, or uh, infidelity, any, anything of the sort? Well, uh, there's one thing about al alcohol there. Uh, there's a 
company known internationally, company called C. C. Agrams. Okay. They they uh, had a uh, a uh, technician which went to uh, to uh, Russia, and they said they heard that Russia was doing some work on uh, using oxygen in some of their uh, their high alcohol con content stuff. And uh, they asked, asked us who, whether we knew anything about it. We said, we don't know anything about it, but if you want to do some research work there, we will help you. So we uh, uh, developed a uh, safe technology for them to introduce pure oxygen uh, using the porous plug. Okay, yeah. To uh, infiltrate oxygen in the alcohols which they have in the barrel to age it, and <laughs> and we manage to to lower the time it requires to age the alcohol. Huh. But unfortunately, the law says that uh, when you age alcohol, you have to age it for a certain length of time. So any Thing that you do to accelerate the aging pro process would not help you on the commercial end. Okay, because you because you have to age it for a certain length of time. But what if could you have sold it? Sold the alcohol that was aged, saying it was um, aged with oxygen or artificially aged? Could you sell it then, or no, is still no. weren't allowed? Uh, no. Okay, so it had to be a specific yeah, amount of years. Yeah. But uh, we. Uh, we e eventually developed a technology f for accelerated a aging of uh, of port. Of port, yeah. I love port. Yeah. Okay. Port and wines, and wine. but main, mainly in ports because the alcohol content is higher. It's higher, yeah. They accelerated a aging of port, okay. which is used co co commercially. Okay. So you were involved in. in uh, I first. was. Uh, I was in, in involved to help the boys out in in the field. Okay. Yes. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, that's my involvement in alcohol, <laughs> and uh, and uh, there was a very very sad thing. The distiller C C Agram, which is uh, the C Agram group, gave gave us uh, two dozen. Bottles of uh, un uh, let's say uh, un aged alcohol for our lab to try out. Okay. And the boys put it on on a sill on a win window, and and uh, one weekend we had a storm. In Montreal, and the window blew open and knocked the two dozen bottles over. We lost the two dozen. You lost every single lost one. Lost two dozen bottles in their lab. The <laughs> window got blown. That's too open. bad. What was the? Uh, was that port as well? Or was uh, it no, that would be the uh, the uh, 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 the uh, the uh, un un uh, Asia. Just uh, whiskey. Whiskey, okay. Yeah. Whiskey. Mm. And um, change a bit of a sure. pace here. Um, in your in your career, you seem like you were quite a uh, quite a leader, quite a mentor, quite a an ingenious person. But did you, uh, at least when you started, have any mentors, or do you remember someone specifically uh, in your career that that really? Pushed you or taught you many things. Uh, there was one person uh, by the name of Frank Carey, F R A N K K E R R Y, okay. who had been a uh, liquid uh, technical person for a long time, and uh, he was the one who got me started in metallurgy. 
So he did he convince you even before uh, McGill? Uh, he he convinced me when I started with um, late career. Okay, at the beginning of your career. Yeah. And he was the first one who used oxygen for accelerated combustion of the flame in the old open hearth furnace for refining steel. That was before our submerged injection mm -hmm. of oxygen or top lancing of pure uh, oxygen in the old fashioned old open hearth okay. at the, the steel company. S at what they call Stelco, which is now a division of US Steel. So he has started me off, and uh, I give him credit for my interest in metallurgy. Was he, uh, was he much older than you, or did he yes, start? At, yes. He was much older. Yeah, okay. Right. So you had uh, a, a fruitful career after, yeah, yeah, after him. Right. And, uh, and uh, when he left uh, Montreal, he went down to New York, and he started up our company in designing and selling in industrial oxygen plants. Okay. Yeah, a brilliant chap. Hmm. And he just died la last year. Oh, wow. Yeah. How old was he? In the 90s. Okay. Okay. Well. Um, now... Being 90s, I can tell you, is a young age. Is young? I'm 91. 91. Still, uh, <laughs> still look good. Still look well, my good. mother, my mother passed away at 103, so I'm gonna beat her. You're gonna beat her? I believe you. I, I wasn't even sure it was you downstairs because I, I thought you looked too young for 91. <laughs> Thank you. For real. <laughs> um, now, now as for the. Um, you had talked a bit about your your inventions, your ingenuity during your career. So if we can get a bit more into that, um, you uh, I see here you you hold over a dozen inventions and over two hundred patents. Um, according to you, I don't know if you've already mentioned. If so, uh, you can let us know. But which of the inventions or patents or, or big changes like that do you consider to be the most important to you for you? For me, the, mm -hmm. the one for steel. Uh, it started off with steel, and then we used that technology for, uh, it's a combination of the technology, the porous plug and, and the lancing and so on. And uh, that uh, eventually translated in into copper and the nickel refining and so on. And you said that that affected the entire world. That's how they do it oh, everywhere yes, now. Right. Yeah. Yes. So yes. yeah, that, that is a big deal. So that would also be not only according to you, but if you were to look at the world of metallurgy itself, that's probably the biggest contribution yes. you, uh, you gave. Yeah. And uh, d different companies will use the oxygen technology, develop their own little twist to mm -hmm. make it work for their own plant. Okay. So it's uh, in, in pyrometallurgy, the thought of using uh, uh, oxygen is uh, not considered dangerous now. And uh, we also developed this to use oxygen for enhanced recovery of oil. How does that work? Well, uh, enhanced re recovery of, of oil, uh, the one person started to use air, and he found that the temperature of the re reservoir increased in temperature. So there must be uh, some combustion of the oil mm -hmm. ta taking place. So that fellow by the name of Phil, Phil White from Texas came, came, came up and talked to me. He says, can you use pure oxygen? I said, I don't know, but let's try it. <laughs> so, so we got the company Husky, uh, Petrol Canada, Dome Petroleum, to try it out. 
And it worked. And, and uh, we had four projects out in uh, northern Alberta here, and we tried it, and, and, and it worked. And, and then when, when we were ready to go commercial on one, one of the plants, the oil price plunged from around two, three dollars per barrel at that time down to less than one dollar wow. per barrel and everybody pulled up. Oh, okay. That was in the early 80s, way before you were born. <laughs> yeah, a bit, a bit. <laughs> I, I was born in 1990, so. This was an early, I think we started there, 81, 82. Okay. And that, so it, it, it seemed to work, you were saying, but it seemed canceled seemed, because of yeah, money. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. That's a shame. O Operation Successful Patient Died. Sorry? Operation Successful, successful Patient, patient yeah. Died. Yeah. That is what transpired when, when you are trying to forge a new technology. Uh, it, it is, uh, they always look for a reason why they shouldn't do it. Mm. Yeah. Um, now, as, um, as someone who's been with uh, Liquid Air, uh, his entire life, but not only that, I uh, graduated in 47, you were saying. Uh, and I know after World War II, uh, the, the oxygen industry was dominated by a company called Lindy, right? And Ali Kid pierced through that, basically, an industry that was monopolized by, by Lindy. Yeah. Where you were part of that movement. Uh, well, I, I, I was part of that move, movement by developing new technology for the use of O2 gas, but I had nothing to do with the price of oxygen or the sales of plant. But do you think uh, Ali Kid kind of burst into that market uh, post-World War II because in part of uh, uh, how ingenious uh, Ali uh, Kid was being? Yes, we developed new processes for use of O2 gas. And that's really what uh, yeah, differentiated right, you right, with Lindy? Yeah. Okay. Um, in, now, throughout your, throughout your life, what, what would you say is the proudest, uh, what are you proudest of in life? Develop the technology for pyrometallurgy. Just uh, all of them? Yeah. Yeah. All of them. And the, if you had to pick one or, or two, what's the biggest um, lesson you've learned in life? The biggest lesson... Or you could uh, give to someone younger like me. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the biggest lesson I learned in my life is mainly in the, in the field of research and technology. The most important thing to do is to not let your, uh, your technologists and scientists working for you to go into the com computer and say, oh, look what I just found. Our competitor is doing this. Our competitor is doing, doing that. They said, we should do some work along that line to catch up. I said, you're wasting your time. You should not be trying to catch up. You should do something to leapfrog them or do something different. Completely and different. and I had a hard time convincing them not to do what our competitor is doing because when they let you know that they're doing this in the internet, they're onto something else. Yeah, by that time it's yeah. too late. You do something novel, new. Don't try to catch up to what your competitor is doing. Okay. This is the main thing which I always tell my scientists and engineer. Use your brains, and I do give them 10 to 15% of their time to do whatever they wish to do in our lab, even if they have a
poker game among themselves. It's all okay. Yeah, so let the let the creative yeah. creativity fly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Yeah, well, you see that more and more actually with uh, many companies, especially yeah. if you look at tech companies now. They do that a lot. Like uh, Google, a yeah. monster company. Yeah. That's what they do now. Uh, it's all about kind of living to work, but yeah. making work your life. But at the yeah. same time, while you're at work, just letting creativity yeah. roam free. Right? Do you know this is one re reason why I never learned how to use a computer, even though in high school I learned how to type. I used to type 60 words per per, uh, per minute, per minute yeah. and and now I don't even know how to type. I don't even know how to get into the com computer. My wife does all that work for oh, yeah? me <laughs> because I feel that's a waste of time because I learned that when I was in research work, when all my scientists and engineers was going into the computer to find out what our competitors were doing. So I, so I said, I don't like <laughs> the computer. So, so I'm ignorant on <laughs> knowing what the computer can do for me or, mm -hmm. or how to use it. Well, it definitely didn't slow you down from, uh, from what we can see. So you let, you really, uh, you, you were more of a, you kind of work with your hands, try things out, right? Yeah. yeah. Did you read a lot instead? Of, you said a lot of your team, uh, you know, they'd follow yeah. follow uh, inventions or yeah. other companies through the internet. But did you instead were you a big reader or no. more with your hands? I'm a or? slow reader, <laughs> and re reading uh, is very boring. Not unless I see one paragraph. That yeah, in, okay. in, interesting. I got you. I'm kind of like that. It has to be really good. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, and I can tell you right right now. I only try to read something which is novel and new. And I have one project where I am thinking of using oxygen and steam for enhanced recovery of oil. Okay. So, I'm not, so not I, I am not going to tell you the company I'm <laughs> trying to convince to try it out. So, so kind of... Uh, you're, you're going to try to tackle, again, what you had done uh, years ago in, in the 80s a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, using, well, see, in the old days, they only had uh, uh, holes where you drill into the reservoir, vertical holes. But now they have a horizontal component that can go one or two miles long. Mm -hmm. And, that, and that they use steam now what they call SAG-D, Steam Assisted Gravity Drainage, SAG-D, and uh, they have two uh, horizontal uh, pipes, pipes yeah. steam in, in, in the bottom and oil recovery in, in the, no, steam recovery in the top, oil recovery in, in the, the bottom. And I'm trying to kind of convince one, uh, one company to try so we can start it up with all the oxygen, get the reservoir nice and hot, and then gradually stop the steam and use pure O2 O2 gas to generate the heat, okay, and not steam, because uh, when you use steam, you generate the steam above in in the in the steam generator. It's the thirty percent efficient. You bring it down one, two, two miles, you lose heat, and then when you get into the re reservoir, a lot of your BTUs are lost. But if you generate the BTUs right in the reservoir, you will get a very high efficiency, 100%, because With there's no place for the heat to go except in the re reservoir. Okay. So I, I thought I'd say, start it off with steam, and then cut off the steam, and then use pure oxygen only because I can know how to do it so that it will be safe. Safe and, and less energy consumption. And your, your energy is all consumed in the reservoir to heat yeah. the reservoir, to heat the oil, and, uh, and uh, you, you will be 100%. Yeah, no, no waste on the way no down. No waste on the way down or generating your steam with uh, <laughs> 
steam re reformers. There you go. 91 uh, years young, still not done. <laughs> still. It started off in the early 80s, and, and I can tell you, this is my last try, and then <laughs> I will retire. <laughs> Right on. And, well, and then I'll just read about some someone doing it. Oh yeah, <laughs> you'll, you'll pick up a book this time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much. Is there is there anything else you'd like to tell me or, or add um, to uh, to our interview or any oh, message or? No, well, we. Uh, My uh, my great con contribution to the industrial gas industry is in metallurgy, but we also did quite a bit, bit of work on using other types of ga gases. But the main thing is solving little problems with the commercial D apartment. Uh, uh, need to have soft to to uh, to to have a gas contract with a possible client, and I think half of our work was to help the other part of the company. And for this, we had carte blanche on doing what we want to do in research. And I said. I don't think I could find a more pro profitable lifetime of work, the type of work that I was involved with, early kid. Yeah, well, that, that, that's excellent. I think everybody would like to end a career and, and look back and and think and say exactly what you uh, what you just yeah, said. Yeah, and I can still walk into their office in Calgary here and have a cup of coffee and walk, walk out without then questioning me what I want well, there. You, there. <laughs> there you go. You're well. You're a legend now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is part of my life. Yeah. Oh, clearly. A very great part of my life. It's been very in interesting. And as, and as I told you, the last project that I'm going to go on, and I'm not going to do any more successful or not are you sure yeah successful or not or not you're you're done after this one i'm done <laughs> gonna spend more time with my wife at home yes okay that's a good choice too <laughs> the well, we're important. we're all in the late 80s early 90s and uh, our time on this earth not gonna be as long as yours mm -hmm. true just going to take it easy. True. Good. Well, uh, Mr. Lee, thanks, thanks a lot for... Uh, for well, it, I'm, I'm awfully sorry I have to jump around a, a little bit because when you get to my age, uh, your brain uh, is very, very fleeting. Things come back, things disappear.